Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first discussion of Peril's Gate. This is the sixth book in the Wars of Light and Shadow series by Jani Watts. When we are about halfway through this book, we'd be about halfway through the series, which is really cool. Um, <laughs> we are working our way through this book approximately 100 pages at a time. Uh, this Today's discussion will be for the first four chapters, which covers up to 159 pages in this paperback edition. With me, I have not no swiping, Jared. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with me, I have the usual group of friends. Jared, would you like to start us off with introductions? Uh, sure. I'm Jared. I run the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel, and um, and I run a, and I do a bunch of stuff on pagedoing.com that I like to uh, check out. So check it out. <laughs> Chibi. Uh, I'm Chibi Po. Um, I don't run, you know, anything in particular. Um, I just, you know, pop onto Twitter and, you know, promote these books and other books. And, you know, I lurk around on page chewing, but I've been kind of busy. So I haven't really said much there lately, but I can still be found there. Hi, uh, I'm Matt, also known as Miggins or Hobbit Hole Books over on Twitter. Um, I'm also on page two or mostly active on Twitter and I'm also a reviewer over at Fancy Book Critic and but yeah that's where you'll find me. Very nice so in we started off pretty much where we left off in Grand Conspiracy which I think is a first for the series right usually there's some sort of time gap between books is there not? Uh, there's yeah there's a Decent amount of, you know, time gap. You know, we have five years between Curse and Ships, and then, yeah, you know, uh, Warhost, you know, is a, got a little bit of a short, you know, time period, uh, but it's not not too long. Um, and then I don't remember, it's a couple of years between Warhost and Ships and Warhost and Fugitive Prince. And then, well, we saw a whole bunch of time, you know, between Grand, you know, across Grand Conspiracy, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, great conspiracy. Yeah, right. Had like a fifteen-year gap. In also, you said you, your copy had like a hundred. You know, the four chapters cover like one hundred and fifty-nine pages, and yeah, uh, that's wow. Yeah. One fifty. What they did with the font? Because you know the original paperback, you know, mass market paperback, one hundred and eighty-four pages. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, the font is tiny in these. It books. is pretty small in here, yeah. <laughs> Mine's one hundred and thirty-two, I think. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's the hardcover though. Yeah. There's more it's page room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this this yeah. font is among the tiniest I have read. Yeah, I, I have seen tinier, but <laughs> I think it's um well, just as a brief thing, I think the next book is really bad about that. So you may want to like look at an ebook for it or. Hmm. Um, okay. Even if you have a physical copy, because the 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 main paperback, the newest paperback, is like really really tiny. Hmm. Oh, like this version? Yeah. yeah. Uh, good. I have the I had the big paperback for for the next. Oh, one. nice. I'm nice. looking forward to that. <laughs> Very cool. So Fionn Arit is being mad at Arathon and slowing things down. And they find Dakar and then immediately start a duel. <laughs> I think that, that that was one of the most gripping scenes for me. In well, not in the book. It's too early in the book to say, but so far it has been one of the most gripping scenes <laughs> with the tension building up with the guards coming to find them and the duel itself. It it was all very brilliantly done. Yeah. Well, the ironic thing was that. Dakar gave them that drink that kind of restored their vitality a little bit, which kind of just led to them being foolish and resuming their fighting with each other, and because uh, they got their their uh, their energy back, and uh, so that was kind of you know he was it was it was more to heal them and and get them you know in in to give them the means to keep going, and uh, they end up they end up like trying to fight. I mean. Arathon didn't really have much of a challenge, so it wasn't like uh, uh, much for him. But um, it was, yeah, that was, uh, 
it's kind of interesting. It, it just showed you that Fion was still young and he's still, you know, it, not, uh, he's not wise to, enough to get beyond his own emotions and his, his own inner turmoil, you know? Yeah, it was really cool to see. I think it was on two pages back to back. We saw from Fionn's perspective that he's throwing every last stop and he's feeling really good about himself, that he's being a good swordsman. He also has a moment of confidence where he thinks he's he's already a really good singer and whatnot. He, there's no way he's so good at two things. I I have him, no problem. <laughs> and then, and then in on immediately on the next page, we see Arathon is basically just playing with him, and mm -hmm. so that. That flippant perspective, I thought, was really cool too. And and also, I think we got a Dakar point of view where he sees that everything he's doing, he's almost mocking uh, Fionn with how he's participating in the duel. One of my favorite moments that, because I was really kind of closely reading it this time, was something that I hadn't noticed before. But there's this uh, scene where... Uh, early on, I think, um, where Arafon and Theon are hunkering down this little patch of grass and they're hiding and somebody comes along and they're really kind of packed in tight and just gazing into one another. And Arafon just kind of goes, well, you know, we, we kind of expected this really, just kind of like this moment to break the tension, this kind of very dry sort of humour. And I was it just really made me laugh, just imagining like Theon's pure almost hatred of Arafon and him having to be forced to kind of like to sit really tightly snugly close to his enemy and then Arafon's just like well you know we, we expected this <laughs> <laughs> just really made me laugh <laughs> yeah. yeah I thought it did a really good job of illustrating that um, I mean basically Fion is really high on his own supply you know he's just like 100 percent oh hello all right now now he needs to introduce himself now that he's here <laughs> okay i'm chris chronicle of chris <laughs> patreon.com speculative speculations you can find me in all those places rock on very nice <laughs> <laughs> now you can make shots you speak fast enough for that <laughs> <laughs> go on uh, TV yeah button. he's just you know he's and then as it goes forward he's just like you know, blah blah blah. It's like you know, he was there, witnessed all the stuff that happened at the Grand conspiracy, and it's just like it has not sunk into him at all, even a little bit. That you know, you know, this is the situation is anything but you know a simple one. He's still like rah rah rah, you're evil, blah 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 blah, and I am the destined hero to you know who will crush you. This is my destiny. Meanwhile, Arthur's like, let's run through all the basic sword fighting patterns, shall we? Yeah, and that that was interesting too because, I mean, he set such store by his destiny that he thinks it's his destiny to destroy the Master of Shadows, who nobody has been able to touch for over thirty years. Now it's his destiny to do it. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, we were discussing the duel between Arathon and what's Fion. The, Fion. Yes. Yeah, so it's so like she she absolutely nails that he's just this headstrong teenager who's just huffing his own supply because like he's like, This is my destiny, I will do this. I'm like, did you actually did anyone ever actually, you know, read the birth prophecy to you? It doesn't really say anything like that, but you know, you know, did he just no one talk about it to him? And he's just like, You had a birth prophecy, you will do great things, blah 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 or something. You know, a birth prophecy said you will be trained for the sword. And he just took that to be like, I am the destined savior of everything. It's like, wow, you're you've got a very large head and you have no idea about anything. <laughs> yeah, it, that that's an interesting point. Is it possible he has all these notions just because he was treated differently from all his siblings and maybe pretty much everyone in the village that he lived in because he was the only one I think who was trained and they had to hire people specially to come train him and I I don't know how much he remembers what the Koryani did to him but it's possible he interpreted that also as 
uh, because he's special somehow and so on and so forth. So he doesn't actually know the prophecy. He just has all high notions from the things that have been happening around him. Yeah. But he's just yeah, a ghost. Something like that. But because he does, you know, he does remember. We know he remembers Lorinda because he called her out, you know, before everything got, you know, odd there. Um, you know, and Lorinda just kind of, you know, it's like, Psh, whatever, you know, and dismissed him. And, but yeah, over the, in that fight and then the later scene, it's just like, he's just. It's like he's just flip flopping all over the place. He's like blah 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 blah. He's like yeah. He she really nails that he's a a stupid teenager <laughs> who hasn't figured out who he is yet. Yeah, and I think Johnny oh, does really nail these things. Uh, there was one sentence that I had that was about this description of being drunk, which I thought she really nailed, and it was. Uh, Feels like your innards got packed with wet sand with river rocks jammed in your eye sockets. <laughs> I've never had anyone as brilliantly described as what it's like to be hungover as that. <laughs> and I liked when Arathon handed back Dakar's uh, concoction to him and said, You can get drunk on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so bad that even Dakar doesn't want to drink it. And the, the funny thing is that the the, uh, the the fighting was still foolish, even on Arathon's part, I thought, because yeah. it did end up giving away their location to the ch soldiers chasing them, and uh, so that just led that just made life harder for for all of them. Um, and it was soon after that that uh, that Arathon had to leave Beyon in Dakar's hands. Um, which another burden for Dakar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I I I was thinking about that. Why did Arathon decide that now is the best place to hash this out and be done with? Because it had to come later, but were they looking at months before they could get to any sort of safety and they needed to get this over with now? Good question. Mm -hmm. Did he not? Did Arathon not want Fion to be go to that place? The uh, yeah, the uh, the ruins. You know the the it's the sacred the place there. Yeah, yeah. But he didn't know he was going there until Luhain made contact. Oh, he right, yeah, he yeah. was headed to one of the ships. Um, I think That's they right. were going to go to Evanstar, then go from there to the. Kitian and, and try to get to uh, Lestron and whatnot. Oh yeah, Elstron then the other ship. But but Arthur's been in a bit of a, a spell of making like poor judgment calls. Even going to get Fion in the first place was sort of folly in its own right because again, he's, they ended up sparing the life of an innocent. But between this then having the fight then having the fight so that Fionn comes around to then having to leave Fionn and Dakar anyway none of it really achieved anything in, in, in the big cycle of things and actually put um, Arthur close to death as it turned out because of his own sort of foolishness and hubris yeah he's actually described as raw at one point his, his emotions really mm. stripped bare but the thing that worries me is that he's, he's putting this aside to focus on this escape which is obviously the immediate danger but then what is pulling all these emotions inside himself going to do that's going to come out at some point and he's as we've had it described he's really raw so these emotions like what's going to happen when inevitably this all comes pouring out that's what worries me you know mm -hmm. interesting yeah <laughs> I actually thought it was going to go down another path because I still have this idea that with him being close to death, the hold of the mistreth or death the air on the cursing him actually will lessen if he actually is close to death because it's a living being and it will not die with Arathon. So actually, if he gets close to death, there might be some movement in the attachment of the, the curse to, to him. I thought that's actually the reason that this was happening, narratively speaking, is because we would get, but we didn't get any of that, of course. As usual, I had a prediction in my head and was wholly wrong. As is my as my thing. 
<laughs> oh, but that makes sense, though. I I do wonder what that interaction would be like if. Mm. Um, I guess the mistake would do everything possible to not let the person die. Did we all? Did we even see that happen before? I mean, not from illness, but from when they know they are about to be killed by someone, or when they are in the way of harm. I think the mistake takes over to some extent. I seem to recall this happening, but I could be making it up. But yeah. yeah. That is an and I, point. I wonder how the obligation, Arthur's obligation to the fellowship ties into that as well, because obviously he's not in control of his own life either to that extent, because he's obviously promised by blood oath or otherwise that he will not end his own life as an easy way out of, of fixing the, the pain and suffering that he's causing. Yeah, yeah. It It is sad that it makes him feel need to kill people over it or yeah yeah uh in it in us uh, it's somebody referred to fion as um an expendable cipher and uh i forget who it was though and that but that was when fion was left in dakar's hands um and so what when did Seth Veer, well, not Seth Veer, one of the sorcerers, uh, change Arathon's mind about going to the other place. I think it was soon after he had left the safe house that Dakar had for them. Okay. Uh, when he was, was on, yeah. yeah, he was right. making his way to the mountains already. Yeah. I, I think he still had to go the same direction, but where he went from there mm -hmm. was different. Well, I mean, the thing too is like he 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 you know forces the the duel because you know he knows that Fion's not gonna um it's gonna be a stupid little butt you know um, if he doesn't you know uh, go along with it and whatnot and it's funniest through the duel is you know how you you see how badly Fion you know is like misrepresenting everything. When Fionn's like, begin, start the trial whenever you please. And Arathon's like, oh, no, 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 no. You you want to do this, you're going to attack first. And Fionn just completely misinterprets that. Doesn't get that, you know, what's being said there. He's like, you think I lack courage? It's like, uh, that's not what he's saying. Mm -hmm. You know, it had nothing to do with that. And just you realizing, you know, and he has no idea how out of, out of his depth he is. But, you know, that whole thing you know then explodes with the uh, you know the guards the lancers coming in and narathon has to run um but i always thought is interesting is because if it weren't for a certain other person's actions after he meets up with luhane it's entirely likely arathon could have just doubled back and met back up with them um because luhane had already you know uh led the used his thing to you know shield arathon and let them you know, the Lancers get confused and whatnot. Um, but as we know, a certain someone's really, 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 really pissed. This <laughs> does something very, un, you know, very, Who very. Who would that be? Hmm. I, I hmm. wonder. Her name Lorinda, I think, maybe. Yeah. Black hair. <laughs> <A little vindictive. laughs> uh, yeah, she swears vengeance and cast uh, quite another evil spell, I would say. Uh, this GS, oh, this GS over uh, the soldier there that is a captain, right? And uh, who uh, basically won't let him give up the chase. <laughs> uh, so that was um, talk about uh, taking away somebody's free will. Uh, there yeah. you go. She's she's playing fast and loose with everybody's free will. Apparently, first Fion, then this guy. I'm sure there were a few other people along the way. And, and I love the reasoning. The reasoning is that uh, Arathon's boundless compassion has touched and uprooted her sense of inner alignment. How <laughs> dare he? <laughs> I, just, I just love that line. <laughs> yeah, just the amount of you know hate though, like you know, like just this passage alone. May you die alone, Arathon, uh, tears to fallen. 
Let, let your cursed seed wither and your line finish airless. May your field clansmen fall to woe while your bones become stripped by the crows and the peaks of the sky shields. And then she talks yeah. about, uh, you, know, you know, what she's, you know, you know, when she's, you know, she's like, Arathon would suffer ex against their harrying onslaught. Arathon would suffer exhaustion and frostbite and privation. Lorinda meshed her dark seals like link chain. Black hatred ruled her. She would destroy his music. All the bright gifts of his Cephalon uh, heritage would be scared away into mindless animal instinct. And I'm like, wow, you're off the deep end, lady. Just, uh, you know, it's common ill will. No, nothing big. <laughs> but she, she's also not that interesting to read at the moment because she has one note the whole way across. You know what I mean? She has a default position. She doesn't waver off. Unlike just about everybody else in the story at the moment, there's kind of like got the points where they're making good decisions, bad decisions, or, you know, that they're, they're flitting between certain things. So I find her, well, maybe aside from the time that she went to meet the new matriarch, uh, and yeah, wondering what was, was going to happen. Now, that, 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 that was interesting in that point, but her general inner thoughts, I think we know what they are at the moment. They, they are pretty, uh, Stationary and hopping stationary for for a pick and a half now. Yeah, it's like here she like she yeah. lets fly with her you know vengeance and all, and it's like, well, wow, you're angry, okay. Um, and she doesn't, you know, she's like, but she lets her anger just eclipse everything. She doesn't really stop until you get to like chapter four to really, yeah. you know, delve into what's well, like, okay, what exactly did Moriel do? Yeah, what was she going down? She doesn't want to let go of her 15 minutes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It it's interesting also, like I, I agree with you, Chris, that earlier at least her motive was ambition and she he was standing in the way of what she wanted. Mm. Now it's just sheer vengeance and she's just being petty, really intensely petty, I think. Well, okay. So he did do so <laughs> because she reasoned that Moriel betrayed her before Arathon escaped. So there was no way that this was going to end well for her either way. But she still blames him for that. So yeah, the that twisted reasoning she applies bothers me <laughs> every time. So we'll see. We'll see where. Well, I think she's a very she's gone down a very similar path to Lysaia, I think. Mm. Because they've both kind of been shown the light, so to speak. They've had the opportunity to change. They've seen the truth of events and they've just gone, nope, I'm, I'm digging in. I'm digging my heels in and I'm just going to keep on going. So in a way, they, they've followed these two very similar paths. Yeah. What they both need is a good flush of the lane forces near a marker stone like Fionn got. <laughs> But well, to be fair, with Lysay, he had that vision at the um at the Afsa Death, yeah. and that yeah. still wasn't enough. Like, is anything going to be enough to change him? I I don't know. That that's one of the exciting things. Will he be changed by the end of this series? I I really don't know. Uh, and to Lorena's point, her hit and and thing is actually a lot of self hate. You know, it's the worst type. It's not. She's not actually really. I mean, she is angry at Arthur and what he did, etc. But it's the fact that he was able to manipulate her so easily, you know, and and then she had, was powerless to stop it. So, like an awful lot of her 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 anger is directed at herself, even though she won't admit that to herself at this at this stage. Yeah, yeah, I I agree, and and I think it was the same last time too. And there was a brief moment of thought where also um, she felt that. She she realized that she was never going to get Arathon's affection, and she understood why Elera was willing to betray her sisterhood principles, I guess, over Arathon. So that it it's interesting because Lyser and Lorenda both they have these moments of insight, and then they go and do the completely opposite thing that you're supposed to do <laughs> with said insight. Exactly. <laughs> There's almost a sort of like perverse entertainment in it of like kind of mm -hmm. wanting to see 
like just how bad of a decision are they going to make this is ever so slightly entertaining watching them just keep <laughs> falling into these pitfalls yeah <laughs> speaking of pitfalls Arthur's murder of the uh oh the pursuers oh boy that was oh boy, pretty brutal right. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that was uh cuz they were um a lot were wounded and stuff like that and he was you know putting them out of their misery i guess and then yeah. uh but he uh he went he went he, he didn't like it obviously he was uh quite torn about it but uh he went about it with brutal efficiency and mm. uh um that was uh cuz he was shooting the survivors of the the centaur cuz the centaur came out and murdered a whole bunch of these guys um and uh because they would he was mad about the trespassing of these heedless humans and uh then arathon had to go out and finish him off in this brutal fashion and that was that was really uh i mean i love the detail of it. i love the detail of of his wounds and i love the uh what he had to do was it, 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 it was just like it was very it was a very uh powerful section in that that was like in chapter three i think yeah in a very powerful section there was it actually a centaur or was it arathon's shadow i thought like, it was a shadow I I it was, was it a shadow I yeah. I it was. like when uh, one of the sorcerers in one of the other books kind of um did the thing at the tower but it wasn't it wasn't real it was a trick yeah, yeah. yeah it, was, it was just an illusion um the oh. the illitharis you know an actual paravian wouldn't have to you know, wouldn't have to kill them um yeah i think they just go mad right or kind of like what happened with the men who invaded that forest i'd imagine mm. something like that would yeah, happen. There's, yeah yeah all um, oh, right yeah yeah mm. One of the most tragic parts of that for me was that this comes just after Arthur has this sort of fever-induced uh, confrontation with everyone that he's killed. And the fact that Arthur just wants to die, he he wants to, but he can't because he's bound by this blood oath that he's made. And then he's forced to confront all of these past horrors and then to do it again just after he's confronted that like oh my goodness like i hope he gets the death that you know he he wants eventually mm. that he gets some peace because it's just horrific to think about going through that yeah that's a great point um and i like that the it was a very powerful section and the last this was the last line that if he had to do something like this again he'd lose his sanity right, yeah. and that was the chapter or section ender and i thought that that was brilliant because it is a very momentous thought and making it the end of the chapter made it that important somehow uh is anyone else really nervous for arathon's hand because do you think it i don't know do you guys think it will recover properly and he'll be able to play again and everything will be fine or will that be another source of pain for him well he's he's, he's getting the master healer sent him yeah so i mean he has he has a chance there i mean for all of the toughness of reading that last section and the stuff that he's gone through it was another example of Arthur doesn't seem to have much hope or much going for me it's like he's existing moment to moment just survive the next day all the time and there's nothing goes with that, but then we get the news that actually Elora actually is pro is whether she makes it or not. That's always the thing that's 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 up for a uh, question in, in, in this story. But there is the chance that these two will spend some quality time together and actually build some sort of relationship and build some sort of uh, understanding of each other while going to somebody who's near death, send them a master healer. Mm. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah, there's a very romantic view of a book called Pell's Gate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything, but I have nothing to say. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I would like it if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. I did think as soon as I said it out loud. Here's another prediction that I that I've just made that almost certainly means that it won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> All <of the> <laughs> day. I, yeah, I I did think it was, oh, what? Oh, yeah, that Luhain and everybody around Arathon knows that what's hurting him the most is his separation from Elera in the first few chapters. And yeah, I, I, do, I don't think I really, uh, it really struck home until these chapters that they really like each other. <laughs> that, <laughs> because they were together for like five minutes. And then uh, now the separation is costing them so much, which I, I I see that now, and it's it's driving that home, I guess, that they do like each other very much. We I know we got we was we were told that several times before, but <laughs> I really understand it now. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Alara had to choose basically love love over hate when uh, she was in front of the. Um, the new, you know, quote, new uh, uh, prime. Uh, and uh, that was um, that that audience that she had with the new prime. It, and, and Lorenda had to, like, sneak her way in there uh, <laughs> just to get all that bad news <laughs> when she was uh, listening in. Um, but uh, in it was it was interesting because Lorenda was kind of held up a mirror in that meeting to her own failings mm -hmm. because of how much of a backbone Alara had while dealing with the prime. Um, and when Alara finally left there, of course, the prime is like, yeah, it's all part of my plan, you know, and. Um, uh, and so uh, it was just it was just a that was the um you know was showed the depth of she had to choose love uh in order to continue on her mission and even even when she left there she was thinking of ways to plan around it plan around what the prime was planning for her and uh so i'm looking forward to seeing how that all plays out after this chapter Yet it seems as though Moriel's not in control anymore of Valera, certainly both by Valera's action, but then also by Sethir's interference in in that whole thing. Because, I mean, there was a very key line. I had to read it three times just to make sure. Uh, but her li life force is not tied to the Coriani anymore. It is tied to the Fellowship, uh, which has always been one of the driving factors for her is the fact that the Boreal could basically end her life at any stage, but actually it's now been passed to the hands of the Fellowship, and whether Alara knows that yet or not, that actually gives Moriel a lot less leverage than, than what she thought. Or, or maybe uh, I picked that up wrong. Yeah, it might be. No, they, she's still um, oath sworn to the Coriani. Um, the uh, um, the adept, you know, keeps her from cleansing the crystal, which yep. would have exposed that, you know, she wasn't, um, uh, that they had, you know, done the whole thing with the life, the longevity, longevity, you know, spell back in ships. Um, and, uh, but she, you know, she still made the swearing over the Skyron crystal. So even if she cleared hers, um, you know, uh, Moriel still, Salidi still has that. So, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway. So, what was what was the deal with with the uh, putting the crystal into the salt water? And I was a little unclear what exactly happened there. That she crystal was... that that was the one that Salidi gave her, and she cleared it, which clears any 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 spells or anything that have been implanted inside it, because she was afraid that you know Salidi had planted some kind of trap inside right. the crystal so she you know cleared it and erased everything any records that it would have you know so that if she used it you know she wouldn't be you know triggering some hidden trap what's that sorry go ahead Jared. that but that's all it was though she wasn't trying to um 
it wasn't her own crystal then it was it was a crystal given the to her first the one prime. was the one that the prime gave her and then okay she was going to dunk her own but then oh the that's when the depth stopped, stopped her. her right okay all right that's right all right so didn't we see Kaol kill some Koryani enchantresses by dunking their crystals in salt water? That's right, yeah. Uh, but he used fire first. Way back in... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. he heated it with the flame and then dropped it in there and it, you know, the combo, you know, what he did, yeah, stripped it. Right. Um, and, you know, since he stripped all the things, that crystal had that he stripped and shattered and not just, you know, destroyed, uh, all the woman's uh, longevity spells were broken too. So she just aged like, yeah, right. 300 yeah. years in, in an instant. Got it. Okay. So he destroyed this, the crystal. It wasn't just the salt water, it was other things he did. Okay. When he dunked it, it cleared everything that was in the crystal and caused it to shatter. And oh, I see. Okay. You know, all the spells that were tied to the crystal, you know, went boom. Um, and, you know, the backlash caused her to age, the lady to age and, you know, whatnot. It's okay, really okay. interesting to see the adepts come back into the story, though. That, uh, that whole part yeah. of, the, uh, of the world, I think, was again one of the most interesting and not yet explored that much parts of the story that we've had so far you know going back to Lysir's involvement when he's seen his visions etc and we see actually the role that, that they are playing and how important they are especially to Sethir's well-being at the moment because yeah I, I, I think that indicates that some level of urgency about the world that they're being they're more involved now and uh and, and the sorcerers seem a little bit you know, antsy and upset, and yeah, and uh, they have a lot going on, and um, it looks like, <laughs> yeah, and it looks like the adepts, ass adepts, are trying to fill in and help out with um, some of that stuff, and uh, it just uh, gives us all a sense of a bigger sense of urgency that of events culminating and happening. Mm. Yeah. It, it was interesting that they wouldn't interfere in stopping the mistreats from returning and uh, because they think all creatures are equal in art size and so they won't participate in any sort of violence. I thought that's, that's really cool I, because Arathon for all his, um, he is compelled to, but he, he does participate in committing violence. So to have an organization that completely stays away from that uh watching how they play into the story i think that that will be interesting yep but also interesting to see how seth fear has taken the smallest chink of suggestion and decided to act on it proactively whereas up to this point where the fellowship have been doing lots of things they've been kind of hands off for an awful lot of it you know, saying, oh, we really don't have justification there. And Seth Fears just basically went, actually, no, we had a had an opportunity here with her taking control of her own life. She sort of invited us in to interfere, which I think is a, a change in an approach, certainly, from, from, from Seth Fears rather than just watching. Mm. If, if I remember correctly they were involved in kind of like destroying the previous um place they won and they the the sorcerers and they don't want to do that again you know so maybe they're kind of starting to think okay things are getting really bad again maybe we should maybe we should take a different tactic while still within the bounds of our compact yeah you know because we they don't want it to end up like last time that's like did yeah And uh, what's up with um, Lysaia and friends doing these blood rituals? Uh, these, yeah, blood, uh, rit blood rituals are always above board, aren't they? They're, they're always, yeah. you know, they have something to be supported. In <laughs> <laughs> it ain't a delight, you know. <laughs> 
Look, he's just keeping track of where Arathun's going. That's he's concerned it. for his brother. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> is that is that the same blood that is it Luhain when he's looking at all the parallel events and a little bit into the future as well? He sees a stain of blood somewhere from a ritual. Is that mm, is that the one okay, that's being okay. referenced? Because I was wondering whether it was something that we'd already seen before or if it's about to happen. But I, I think his parallel events were thing events that were happening at the same time. Were there? It was. It was. Mm. It wasn't that he could traverse time so much. It was that he could see things that, that were happening at the same time. So. I hadn't yeah. thought of that actually, but he was, that, he was outside really space time, which is pretty cool. <laughs> and at one point, they go into space. He's kind of like in Al Alphane Tower, and then he's kind of like Superman's out of the roof, <laughs> up into space. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm going to picture him dressed very differently the next scene he's in, though, man. <laughs> 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 That's funny. <laughs> so the speaking of across space time, we found out a bit more about the spell that used to hold the mistrait. That we need someone on the other side of the veil and someone on like with physical presence. So because it extends across across the veil, I imagine is where people go when they die. Is that are we given to understand that? Did we get any more explanation than that? Uh, yeah, they they need uh, um, uh, someone you know grounded physically and a um, spirit form because that's mm. how they cast it to begin with. It was mm. uh, like uh, Asundir and I don't know Caradmon or Luhain, whichever one it was. Um, it might have been yeah, it might have been Caradmon um, uh, at the time who you know did the ward and then. Um, and so they needed someone else to, uh, yeah, because they're, they're shorthanded, the car has to go help. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. What was interesting was I noticed a lot of reference to the mysteries as well, as, as we get closer towards the halfway mark and heading towards the song of the mysteries, mm. there were a few more references that kind of tantalizing us as to what the mysteries are. Oh, elaborate. <laughs> well, one of the things that I picked up on <laughs> was early on, I think it's in chapter one. So when Seth there, um, I wasn't entirely sure what he did, but this is what I noted down. So he went outside of space and time to create this form. And it was only once the mysteries had parted that it was enabled to be anchored in the real world. So it had to have the mysteries were involved somehow. It wasn't until they sort of gave some sort of ascent that this thing could be grounded and brought from outside of space and time and then into the physical realm. It had to pass through the mysteries, whatever that is. Was that the part where he was trying to help out us and there? Um, I think so. Yeah, like there's like a some fiends or some lava or something and he was right in the, at the end of trying to help the, them their up. part in chapter one delirium or whatever that part is I'm trying to find it here oh yeah 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 it's the end of end of uh yeah near the end of chapter one yeah yes exactly yeah missed it <laughs> yeah we saw the fellowship do a lot of cool magic in these chapters right i mm. i especially love the one with Cardmon where he basically collapses his identity and his self so that he can figure out what's going on mm. on the on marak uh and what <laughs> what rates are coming and so on and so forth and then he, he goes chasing after them which yeah um I think that's the that's the, that's the conflict I'm most interested in at the moment. That, mm. and and yeah. Seth with the what he does with the Grimward is really cool too. And 
We haven't. Did we see any Asandir luck? Well, Sundir right at the end of chapter one, you know, mm. shows up at a Kraken's um, uh, Grimward and disperses uh, yeah. the uh, the Yats and then takes over uh, Sethru's spell. Right. But uh, can we, you know, have a you know, uh, wow at Sethvir because he's still holding what six or seven Grimwards? You know, mm-hmm. um, steady. You know that we know if one of them bursts, like it's just going to start warping everything around it. Yeah, you know, every fabric of reality, and that's just kind of mind-boggling. Yeah, I, I noted down actually. This we we really have this almost set of Chekhov's guns that are waiting to go, and mm. I noted down a lot of them. So at the moment, at my counting, so we've got Lysaia is headed in the direction that Arafan is running towards. And in the other direction, behind him, he's being pursued from jail by these mage-driven soldiers who are so uh, absolutely just stubborn in their pursuit that they've got these dogs that they've literally like cut out their tongues to keep them silent. Like they're so just intent in their purpose. There's the King's Drake, a kraken, where mm. his nightmares could be unleashed and warp reality, as you said. There's the misrafes that are in Rockfall. There's the remaining mistrafes that are on Marek that are now seeing this red flashing beacon. Come here, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's the Black Rose prophecy. The Cadrum have been unleashed. Lysaia's allies are using dark blood rituals and magic. Davian's awakened. We don't know if he's good or bad at the moment. And any one of these things could go wrong. And I just had this image of, you know, like in, in a movie where somebody's like kind of... Um, Maybe they're like leaving a bath over wrong or something, or there's a leak and they're trying to plug the leak. And then another one comes <laughs> up, another one. And eventually there's like the final one and it all comes flooding out. I'm just waiting for that last flood of, <laughs> oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Yeah. There's like seven or eight things there that every single one of them could go wrong and it would be absolute chaos, which I, I love. That's brilliant. <laughs> so tell me if I noticed this incorrectly, but I think, and, and I like this about the series, that whatever the conflict is, that's what gets resolved. It doesn't get escalated further. So there are all these things that could go wrong and multiple of them could go badly, for instance. But in the case where um, Karadmon, he has a thought to himself that the raids cannot get hold of whatever he knows of the mysteries and uh, his knowledge of... Uh, what, sorcery, right? The raids cannot get a hold of that. I think that, so there's two ways that could go, that he's successful <laughs> at not giving them his knowledge or we could escalate it way further and have the raids do get knowledge from Karadmon. And usually so far in this series, we've seen it resolve, like this conflict is already serious enough and mm-hmm we'll resolve it right here that Karadman will just do an excellent job of not letting the raids have his knowledge. <laughs> my, my, I'm, I'm going to predict that it does not escalate further from there, which, which I would like very much because then you escalate to a point where it feels almost impossible to come back from. But then yeah. when Jani does that, she does come back from, from it really well too. So uh, have you guys noticed that, that the conflict stated on the page is what it is and it doesn't escalate further typically through the series Hmm. I haven't thought about that I would say it doesn't escalate but it does we do learn more and Hmm. so it's never that it grows bigger than what we're first told it's more like oh, we know more about this now. Mm. Oh, this is even worse than before. Not because it's got worse, but just because we know more and we're more aware of what's actually happening and it gets more horrifying the more you know. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. I I agree with that, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, we've had a conflict, you know, with with Elaine, with um, Lysaia's wife. Mm. Um, And the conflict keeps changing. In mm. her case, now all of a sudden she has uh, proof. She, she was given proof of the letter that her um, the former wife was killed, mm. uh, 
And so what does she do with that? Her conflict before was just, you know, trying to, uh, you know, being on, not being uh, paying attention to by Lysayer. And then, and then of course her conflict was dealing with Sarah Bell. And then, mm-hmm. and so now these conflict keeps changing and her situation just seems to be getting worse. Um, and the old conflict she had, Aaron is relevant or, or mm-hmm. you know, and now she's got this, this new one. And, uh, yeah. And so it, 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 and that's like a minor storyline compared to the some of the other stuff, but it's still all tied in and still mm. all, uh, important. So it's pretty cool. On that point, like the whole revealing that uh, Talith was killed, and Sarah doesn't know that. To me, it's it's a it's a hell of a gambit to play because his reaction to that news is unknown. Like, Cerebral is obviously trying to manipulate Elaine and, and kind of get her to, to shun away. But if Elaine gets the word out and it gets to lie, Sarah, that's a hell of a hell of a risk to be playing, to be playing with because yeah. I, it's, it for, is a risk. It's, it's, he's like, he's playing this game where he's, he seems like I'm going to scare her so bad. She's not going to do anything. Yeah. And, uh, I, I don't know if it's going to work or not. Um, I'm kind of hoping that, Elaine shows us and surprises us and shows us uh, something that, uh, you know, we, uh, some sterner stuff, you know, and then we'll, uh, we'll see, you know, but that's, I think that's what he thinks. It's, it's, Cause this guy's cerebral seems to be a little full of himself anyways. He does, yeah. And, um, and so it, uh, that's the game there. I found it interesting on another note that he's actually able to talk to the other priests in their heads or whatever other than just talking to Lysayer. Uh so that was a, a little just a little bit of information that was just kind of snuck in there and uh another little in, bit of information that was snuck in was the the uh the jewels the Coriani have a not mined on a pair right. yeah it's just a little thing Ooh. snuck in and I'm like oh that's going to come into port later that's going to yeah. that's going to come into play um, if it hasn't already, you know, um, and we just skipped over it or something. <laughs> but... we, we weren't just giving that, we were giving that alongside the context that that's why Seth Fear can't, you know, or what Seth Fear's control over things yep. are, are, are things that are only of, of that world, yeah, um, etc. So, yeah. All these little tidbits that that are like, is that important? <laughs> yeah, that, and, and the other big tip that was given, obviously, that uh, Kevor, Kev, Kevor, uh, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm a mage. <laughs> he, might is, a, he might be. He might be a mage. And actually, be. I had I, I'd never even considered that. What a fool I was. Because uh, that's how genetics works. <laughs> but then if I'd have predicted it, it wouldn't happen. So, you know, he'd have been unhappy. I'm reading so closely now. I sort of, every bird that comes along, I sort of think, is that Davian? Is that Davian? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, does he not stick to eagles? Is he? No, I know, but still in my mind, I sort of <laughs> ignore that and go, oh, this could be Davian watching every time. There was an eagle that Alton spotted at least once, right? In... Yes. Yep. He's in one of the end sort of little paragraphs, isn't he, I think? Yeah. But but no, Johnny, but the way we do, that could be just her fucking with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think if I was in Charlie's possession, every god, I just got a pretty eagle in this scene just because. Yeah. <laughs> and make it disappear when it gets closer. Uh, yeah, like a spider on the wall. You stir it, stir it, it doesn't move. Look away for a second, you look back, it's gone. You know, when you think that, that, that's Davian. There you go. <laughs> Davian's the spider. <laughs> And then it's on a web behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jared, for that. Uh, yeah, it's mid- a straight day. You don't see it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Oh, wait. What else happened in these books, in these chapters? Sorry. So much happens. So much happens in these number of chapters. It's like well, encompassing. Cerebral seems dangerous, though. I, I think. Uh, while he is maybe taking a risk there, he seems like he is in control of himself in a way that Lorenda 
was never in the last book, if you know what I mean, for all her careful mm. planning. She doesn't seem to be operating on the on the same level as Sarah Beth, uh, in terms of like the kind of forethought and what he thinks is going to happen and what is at risk of happening. Which is yeah. which is kind of odd because we don't know much about his upbringing or training mm-hmm. or past or anything mm-hmm. like that. Right. Uh, Lorenda, we know, had been through all these eight levels of training and stuff like that. You know that the Coriani go through, and uh, we we really don't know much about Sarabald and and what kind of past and training he's um, he's had. And I'm I'm still a little. Um, I still don't quite understand how uh, he, I mean, he, obviously he has some sort of magical talent, um, but how it's manifesting and how it's tied into Lysayer, I'm not a hundred percent sure about, and I'm hoping to get more explanation or maybe somebody can ex- explain it to me if we've already seen it somewhere, but uh, I'm hoping to get more explanation on, that in his story so we understand a bit more where he's coming from mm-hmm. yeah it 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 was interesting that he was actively jealous of the prince kevor is his name yeah mm-hmm. um when he took over and so he does want power and i guess he's also manipulating like sir to a certain extent it seems yeah. like but he's Most... threatened by he's threatened by kevor obviously you know especially after what happened um at the end of uh grand conspiracy but he is actively plotting to kill him or to mm-hmm. put him in a position where he'd be killed which again is a hell of a risk for a man that needed uh a he doesn't have multiple kids uh like sir as it turns out he just has the one error yeah Given the Celeste line is all about justice, justice, justice. This seems um, a hell of a gambit. Yeah, yeah, he's up to a lot of stuff, and and, and uh, it really makes me wonder what what his game is. What what is because uh, it's because it seems like he worships Lysaia too mm-hmm. at the same time. Um, so, but he's also he's like worship worshiping him to the point of going against anything that Lysaia might be related to whether Lysaia wants to be related to that or not you know it and so it's uh it's a uh, kind of it's a it's a it's a poisonous relationship really um but I'm not sure I'm not sure at a level of how much Lysaia knows that uh we haven't really seen in that pot of, into his head I guess yet hmm So lots of interesting threads to track. And was there, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we should talk about, but I feel like we covered it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Time to do outros. Mm-hmm. So, oh, I wanted to ask about this, but uh, we, in the, what's the other thing I do? Second apocalypse uh discussions at the end we do quotes so um it <laughs> if you guys have anything that you'd like to read out and quotes. any particular lines or paragraphs that you found interesting I bet for next time. yeah sorry for throwing it out randomly <laughs> I, I do have one i'm, I'm gonna restate yeah. i'll do i'll do my outro and uh read this out give people a bit of a a bit of a chance so it's I'm gonna yeah. repeat the line that I was I was talking about earlier on in terms of how Allura's um her life blood or her life oh it has been changed, yeah. Um so my name's Chris Moon, Chronicle Chris YouTube channel, also on the Patreon forums. But uh the, the adept shook her head. Rest easy, no. The warden's desire was met. One of the brotherhood went to Allura, her spell quartz has been sent to her PRS on cleared. End quote, which meant the order was not yet the wiser for the fact the imprinted longevity binds on the enchantress's life had been supplanted by fellowship crafting. Nice. Is that referring to the thing that it wasn't Trade? I guess it was Luhain 
did when Elira was given the longevity spell. Uh, he came and interfered. He said, I can make this less painful for you. Um, um, is that all that's referring to, or do you think there's more to that? Well, again, the, I think the, the important thing for me is the fact that Moriel doesn't know about it. Yeah. She yeah. thinks she is in control. And I'm not sure uh, Elira doesn't know about it either, because she thinks that Moriel can basically end her life at a moment's notice. But mm -hmm. it's been supplanted. It's been replaced yeah. by the Fellowship in some way, which changes the power balance for Alara specifically and if she knew about it, it would change it even more in a lot of ways so I yeah, thought that was a very sense. important point to make <laughs> makes sense well I have um, uh, I'm Jared Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel and uh, page chewing uh, aficionado um, <laughs> my quote is uh Never cast off useful tools, and that was uh, that was uh, the new prime, uh, exp uh kind of uh, explaining things in a uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, in a manner to Lorenda that like she's explaining things to a child, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. Uh, my name is Matt, also known as Miggins. You can find me over at Twitter at uh, Hobbit Hole Books and soon starting a podcast. So more oh. on that in the future. Yes, yeah, very exciting. My quote, I actually noted which page it was on. So this is, I love this quote. Um, I think it really gives a good sense of, of the vastness and, and the deep of space. So enveloped by the hostile cold of deep vacuum, Alone with the whisper-thin chime of the stars, Caradmon drew himself inward. I just love that description of yeah. space. It's very evocative. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I love that. Yeah. Chibi Po. Uh, Chibi Po. I can be found on page chewing and on Twitter. Um, do I have a quote? Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are so many. Uh, all right. Um, still a little bit of stuff, you know. So you're not fighting, Fiona. I scribbled oh, back should. upright, humiliated and stressed by the blazing pain of a pulled hamstring. Damn you to Sithair's bleakest of pits. You give me no contest at all. You wanted to fight, said Prince Arathon, equivocal. I promised you one chance to test me. The car by the mill caught his breath as the scalding invective struck home. I never once gave my word I'd strike back to cause harm, Rithane's prince added, spitefully reasonable. Then as the goatherd hammered back in offense, he parried, sidestepped, and lagged a half-beat to stoop and fling a snatched snowclawed. So far, boy, you haven't shown me the least little cause to feel threatened. Very nice. Cool. I guess I'll go next. I was looking through my quotes to see which one. There are so many. But uh, I guess I'll do the one about the Gath Dane. And now I lost it. Okay, here we are. Uh, oh, you can find me on the YouTube channel Reading by the Rainy Mountain on the podcast Speculative Speculations and Haunting the Patreon Forums all the time. Uh, the quote I have is, uh, Jolted to gaping embarrassment, Jenza swept to one knee. Her gesture affected no woman's courtesy, but the humility of future Kathleen must show to acknowledge the given hierarchy of old law. Now, the authority of a fellowship charter granted her as fallen liege his right to crown rule in Rathain. <laughs> nice. Nice, nice. All right. So we'll see everyone in two weeks from now. Um reading the next three to four chapters. And yeah, thank you so much for listening. Bye.